Clavicle fractures, this is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, version 5, slides are by Dr. Gudrun Muller, and I am Sakib Rahman narrating, and uh, in the first video we talked about anatomy, deforming forces, we went over a little bit of uh, indications, and um, we started talking about uh, operative uh, fixation, intramedullary fixation of mid-shaft clavicle fractures, and we're going to pick up with that and talk about uh, plating uh, technique. So open reduction internal fixation tends to be the mainstay um, in the United States. Um, and there are different ways to do this. In general, um, even with comminuted fractures, we often do try to get an anatomic uh, reduction to help uh, dial in your rotation and uh, achieve compression uh, when possible. So this could be lag screws and neutralization plates or compression plating and uh, try to stabilize with uh, rigid implants. Uh, plates can be placed superior, um, which is a little bit of a nice flat surface to work with, but the plates can be a little bit prominent. Uh, they do help to resist vertical translation in this position, uh, and uh, the approach is a little bit more extensile if you have to get way, way lateral, um, for example. Uh, anterior um, perhaps is less prominent. You might be able to get longer screws, um, it is uh, less extensile, and uh, we don't really have great large randomized control trials. Dual mini frag plates is kind of the latest trend. Um, so you're dual plating, so there's a little bit uh, more soft tissue stripping, but uh, because there are mini plates, um, they uh, tend to be uh, less symptomatic in terms of needing to remove hardware. Um, so this is something you'll, you'll see, uh, done very frequently, uh, nowadays. So different ways to set this up. Um, but, uh, ideally you'll have a radial lucid OR table. Uh, you can do semi supine versus uh, beach chair. Uh, oftentimes you'll use a central bump under the spine to hyper extend the chest a little bit. Uh, x-rays can come in from the head. You can also do this, um, if you use a uh, radio loosened table and bring the C arm from the opposite side of the table, for instance, like a flat uh, Jackson type table, uh, or um, you can all um, you can also uh, use a uh, sort of diving board extension table with the uh, patient uh, turned the other way, as long as the patient is appropriately supported from a body weight uh, perspective. So a couple of ways to do this. Um, the arm can be prepped in or out. Um, a lot of times you don't really need to manipulate the arm too much. Um, so a couple of nice technique videos. Um, so rather than me just talking about it, head over to otaonline.org and you can check out some really nice uh, technique videos. A um, couple of them, one on ORIF and one on intramedullary nailing. So it's a high quality videos. Um, by some experts that I recommend you check out. Rehab protocols will immediately post-op, dry dressing over the wound, sling for comfort, and uh, we'll start exercises as soon as possible. Um, so Dr. Mueller's uh, philosophy is uh, motion first uh, and then lifting. So once they can get to 120 degrees elevation, they can start some gentle lifting, but nothing heavy uh, for at least uh, six, you know, no real lifting for six weeks and nothing heavy for at least three months. Um, so it depends what kind of work that person is trying to get back to doing. Um, as mentioned in the first video, the supraclavicular nerves traverse your operative incision are kind of coming directly, um, traversing your, your field essentially. So iatrogenic uh, laceration of the nerves can cause numbness over this area, it usually improves with time but uh, can be irritating in some patients, especially people who um, wear straps over that area, um, like women with their bra strap or um, backpack wearers. Uh, hardware irritation is an issue. Uh, you can see hardware removal rates of 15 to 30%. Um, try to wait it out if you can. Wait out if you can, wait uh, at least a year to make sure that you minimize the risk of refracture when you take these off. Outcomes. Well, with ORF, they do generally well uh, in terms of union. Um, and um, I kind of hinted at this in the first video. You know, asymptomatic non union doesn't necessarily need to be treated. You'll have many patients who have some of a 
fibrous union, let's say if you treat it non-surgically, and they may be relatively asymptomatic, very low, relatively low demand. Maybe they have a lot of medical risk for surgery, and they may be fine. Um, so, um, you know, we have a very long history of treating clavicle fractures non-surgically, and I mentioned that in the mid two thousands uh, to late two thousands, we kind of shifted towards doing a lot of ORIF, but shouldn't discount the fact that um, although maybe data wasn't great, maybe we weren't uh, looking at this carefully enough. And if certain certainly, you know, modern medicine has you know continued to progress that we don't have to do something just because we were doing it in the past. But I think there's such a large number of patients treated non surgically who. Um, anecdotally did do well. Maybe the studies weren't all, all that great. So you really have to keep that in, uh, in mind uh, when you decide to, to operate on these. So let's talk about distal uh, clavicle fractures a little bit. So I mentioned this earlier that, um, you know, in the, in the OTA classification, it's just medial uh, shaft and then distal fractures. But um, you also have to take into account um, uh when you're thinking about lateral fractures, uh, where the fracture is in relation to the CC ligaments here. So here you can see, and nicely shown, the trapezoid and uh, coenoid ligaments. Um, so to that end, there is also a near classification for distal clavicle or lateral clavicle fractures that takes this into account. So type 1 is a fracture with the CC ligaments intact. And generally speaking, you're not going to have a lot of displacement with these injuries. A type 2 is um, when you have the CC ligaments uh, detached from the medial fragment, trapezoid is attached to the distal fragment. So you can see there's a type 2A and B. And in type 2A, there's substantial displacement. And the type 2B, not quite as much because you still have some ligament attachment there. So it is important to understand this classification. If you know, if, even if you don't memorize, it's just why does this exist? It exists because uh, understanding displacement with regards to the CC ligaments um, is, is something you got to take into account. And then there's a type three, four, and and five shown here. So um, why does this classification matter? Well, the pattern does help determine the plan. Type 2s and type 5s are notorious non-union generators. Let's go back for a second. Like, So look at some of these type 2s with the really wide displacement and the type 5s. So when you have these and that much displacement, not a lot of bone contact, and these can be you know, uncomfortable non-unions and a lot of deformity. Um, so you may have to do something in these. So the problem is the bone is as we mentioned earlier, cancellus laterally, uh, and very little uh, amount of bone, so not much real estate to fix into. Uh, so templating is important. Make sure you have um, whatever plate you're using. And a lot of periarticular plates now uh, allow for uh, cluster fixation, for example. Uh, so superior plating. So here's an example. We really can't go to you know dual or anterior plating and just have to go straight superior where you have full access uh, all the way out laterally to the um to the ac joint if if and 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 you can go ahead and use one of these plates that have locking screws clustered so you can fix into a short segment now another option is hook plating right so hook plating is often going to need to be removed um to avoid uh, injury to the rotator cuff, but hook plating can really give you a mechanical advantage um, uh, for lateral fixation because of that really, really short segment you're trying to fix into. And sometimes coracoclavicular ligament reconstruction can be included as well. So here's one of these superior plates with clustered lateral um, locking screws. So you can squeeze four or five screws into this really short segment. Um, and this can be augmented with CC ligament constructs. Um, you know, here you can see um, CC screws. So if you're careful, you can target into the coracoid itself or do ligament reconstruction, which can be um, incorporated. And some of the plates even allow for this to have suture button fixation. Um, here's the hook plate. So what's happening here is, you know, you have a plate that's... Um, designed specifically for this. You usually don't have to make this yourself, 
but the plate has this. Again, if you look at the top of the plate, you'll see it's, um, you know, the hook itself goes a little bit posteriorly, um, which is not seen well on this image. Um, so um, the, you fix into the clavicle. Imagine that, you know, in, the, in these cases, the, you know, this, the, this segment is, and this can be used for AC joint disruptions as well, right? So the clavicle segment is way up here, right? And you fix it, you know, um, and you have this hook under here. And as your screws fix into this fragment, this is going to bring this all the way down, right? Um, in fact, you get the reduction before you even put the screws in because you literally, you put this hook underneath and as you push down, it's this plate's already kind of reducing the fracture, um, or an AC joint dislocation. So as I mentioned, these have to be removed due to subacromial irritation. Uh, and just keep in mind, there's very little fixation into the distal fragment itself. So it can sometimes over-reduce the lateral segment. A couple of technique videos uh, for these distal fractures. So head over to otaonline.org and you can see some high quality videos uh, on using the hook plate as well as doing a lateral plate with uh, CC suture augment uh, that we talked about. A little bit about medial fractures before we wrap up. These are rare, 3% of all clavicle fractures. So most are non-displaced. A lot of these are from direct trauma, polytrauma patients with thoracic and chest wall trauma. Uh, it can be a variation on a sternocovicular dislocation. So some of these are intraarticular. And uh, keep in mind, um, in you know, many of your trauma patients, that physis is not closed, uh, even in 20 to 22 year old patients. So it could be a growth plate fracture. Um, so a lot of these are going to do well non-operatively, uh, especially if they're minimally or non-displaced. Uh, occasionally you may have to do ORIF, which is going to be challenging because you're in a small working area. Um, you may have to involve a thoracic surgeon, depending on, you know, whether, um, there is also a thoracic injury or, um, there's manubrial fractures, for example. Um, so, uh, Plate fixation can work here. Um, wires, probably not, uh, you know, uh, smooth pins themselves, probably not the best uh, option. Sternal wires sometimes have to be used in tension band constructs, but you certainly don't want just smooth pins migrating here. So in conclusion, displaced mid-shaft clavicle fractures should be considered fi for fixation if you can determine there's a significant risk for non-union and other criteria like um, smokers, highly displaced fractures, you know, overhead athletes, for example, um, people who want to be able to use their arm as quickly as possible um, for their profession or otherwise. Distal fractures of the near and two, two and five groups um, we talked about in this video should be treated surgically because of high risk of non-union. Um, ORIF with pre-contoured plates does relatively well. Uh, often, a lot of times you got to go in and take plates out, but relatively few complications. And medial fractures usually can be treated non-operatively with good success. So here are some additional references. Some of the figures were used with permission. Thank you very much.